Well, everybody here and also those watching us over the internet, you are very, very welcome. And uh, as Peter mentioned, my name is Ulrika Stewart Hamilton and I'm the chairman of the board of Kultur Rådet. Uh, this event is hosted by the Cultural Collaboration Committee, Samverkansrådet, and you can see all the uh, different agencies involved behind me here. Um, obviously, we're all uh, waiting and looking forward to our keynote speaker, who will give us uh, interesting perspectives on today's theme, Equitable Distribution of Culture divisions within and between countries. And we will examine that, examine that from international perspectives as well as, as trying to fit it into our Swedish context. Our keynote speaker here today is a renowned figure with many years experience in the field of cultural policy. Sir Nicholas Sarota, the chair of Arts Council England and uh, in his speech he will describe how Britain has become a mecca for contemporary art and culture over the last four decades. Um, so Nicholas has already gone down in history for his visionary dynamism and unfaltering belief in the importance of culture. As director of Tate Modern, he transformed this institution into the world's most visited museum with five million visitors a year and branches beyond London. As chair of Arts Council England, his task is even wider in scope, promoting culture across the country. I'm also curious to know Sir Nicholas' views on how Brexit will affect these issues in the future. Access to culture highlights certain divisions in society. Urbanization is one of them. Much of the funding for culture is concentrated to metropolitan areas, despite officially stated objectives that culture should be available to everyone. The member bodies of the Cultural Collaboration Committee, Samverkans Rådet, our host today, promote culture throughout Sweden in a variety of ways. Thanks to the cultural collaboration model, Kultur Samverkans Modellen, as we know it, the regions now enjoy greater influence, as several studies actually have shown. Other megatrends uh, with a major social impact are globalization and digitalization. The issue at stake here is how, for example, Swedish regions and communities can benefit from building international relationships. After we've listened to the keynote speaker, we'll have a conversation with Per Olsson Fried, State Secretary of the Swedish Ministry of Culture, and Kathy Hovlin, newly appointed Director of Cultural Affairs at Region Västra Götaland. Um, and this discussion will be chaired by Ellen Wettmark from the Swedish Arts Council, who was previously a cultural counselor at the Swedish Embassy in London. In conclusion, I welcome everyone here joining us in the garden or watching us on, on the live webcast. The video recording will be posted online with Swedish subtitles in due course. Those of you in the audience who are on social media are welcome to share your thoughts using the hashtag Kulturklyftan. We're looking forward to some fascinating discussions on the subject of cultural policy. So please, Sir Nicholas, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, Ulrika, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and it seems especially appropriate that last night we learned that Sweden and England will meet in the quarterfinal. <laughs> so there's no pressure, no pressure, no pressure at all. Um, it's actually also a very great pleasure to be here at Almadan because um, we don't have anything quite like this in Britain. Um, and it's surprising in a way because uh, we're very fond of festivals and uh, we like celebrations in the summer, um, which is of course a time for free thinking and kind of dreaming about the future, even a better future. 
So it's a great shame that we don't have a, an occasion in England when politicians from different parties come together to discuss issues of partic particular concern. In England, the parties meet separately and they make all of their decisions without reference to others. So it's a very, very interesting situation for me to be here and to understand exactly how this operates here in Sweden. So before I talk about some of the themes that we're going to discuss this morning, I probably ought to say a little bit about myself, but more particularly about the Arts Council. So I'm chair of the Arts Council, which means in theory, I work two days a week for the Arts Council. I'm not the chief executive. There are a big team that run the Arts Council and I just act as the chair. Um, the Arts Council was conceived um, by the economist John Maynard Keynes working in the Second World War when he realized that uh, there was a big public appetite for the arts. Um, and those arts had previously been available mainly to those people who could afford to be engaged. And he felt that as part of the creation of a welfare state, this year we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the foundation of the National Health Service in England, and we celebrate 72 years of the foundation of the Arts Council. 72 is not exactly a year that you celebrate, but you know, I just want to establish that it was even conceived, the Arts Council, before the National Health Service. So originally, the Arts Council looked after what were regarded as the high points of culture, uh, the Royal Opera House in London, and most of the arts many of the arts organizations in London. But over the last 50 years or so, we've seen a gradual democratization of the arts. I mean, Ulrika referred for a, mom a moment ago to the question about the difference between policy and action in terms of access to the arts. Uh, and that continues to be a question, I think. But in principle, at least, since the mid-60s, when the first minister for the arts in England, a woman called Jenny Lee, who was actually the wife of the man who introduced the National Health Service, Anaur in Bevan. She became a minister of the arts in 1964, and in 1965 she published the first government statement on the arts, and in particular about taking the arts, not just in metropolitan centers, but also taking it to what were then called the regions. This was the first time that this, was, this term was used. Before that, it was always the provinces. So they were elevated from being the provinces to being the regions. Now, if you talk about the regions, people even see that as, as if you were talking about the provinces. <laughs> so we've moved forward. So the Arts Council is really charged with delivering that public access. And this year, we invest in, we are investing in eight, more than 800 organizations of all sizes and all disciplines across the country. And we also support, obviously, thousands of individual arts projects and cultural projects each year. We are also the fund holders, that means we hold the purse, for what are called the music education hubs, where young people have an opportunity to study music and to learn uh, the skills of playing an instrument. And we also have a relationship with libraries and museums across the country because we are the development agency for those um, parts of the cultural world. And I think our development role is just as important as our investment role. Our funding is directed in support of our strategic goals, which we agree with our partners and our stakeholders and with government and public. And in 2010, we published a strategy for the Arts Council for the period 2010-2020. We're currently working on a strategy for the period 2020 to 2030, which will be published uh, next year. Uh, we've been engaged in extensive conversations across the country since the beginning of 2018 to establish what that strategy should be. Um, we undertake research, evaluation, we offer training, we offer advice, mentoring, contacts, partnerships, um, and we help organizations develop new ways of diversifying their income. So like all the public sector, since 2020, tw sorry, since 2010, 
our funding has been at an absolute standstill. No increase in cash terms. And therefore, of course, in real terms, a significant reduction, equivalent really to 30% since 2010. Um, but we still invest um, £375 million pounds a year of public money and another roughly £200 million a year from the national lottery. So in total, we have nearly £600 million a year to spend on culture across England. Um, and that money is really the fuel for the cultural life of the nation. So I want to talk briefly about culture uh, and what it might mean to us today, really as a context for the discussion that we will have in a moment on the platform. And I want to talk about our work in communities and particularly our work in place, making places stronger, richer, and the part that culture plays in that process. And in particular about our Creative People and Places program, which is a program that we introduced in 2012 for communities that do not have or have not had great access to the arts. And I also really want to talk a little bit about cultural exchange. So first, culture. So the problem with words, um, as the late playwright Dennis Potter once remarked, uh, is that you don't know whose mouth they have been in. <laughs> but I think it's very important at this moment that we do think a little bit about our use of words and what we mean. And culture is an important word and an important concept. It's been absolutely central to societies from time immemorial. Um, I mean, I was being asked a moment ago by the press, why is culture important? And culture is important. I mean, in a way, everyone in this room will give a different answer. But culture has been present in our societies from the beginning, right from the beginning. So it's not something which came more recently. Um, it can refer to the civilizing effects of the arts and humanities, to structures of beliefs, to the habits that we share, to ideas of ethnicity or faith. Um, it describes what holds us together, uh, but it also describes what can drive us apart. So it can be a complementary term, someone is cultured, uh, but it can also be quite derogatory and in some contexts actually profoundly racist. So as the historian in, Engl in England, Sir Raymond Williams, said in the 1950s in England, he, s he wrote, it's one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language. <laughs> so the Arts Council's challenge, I think, is to take ownership of the word and use it in its most positive and inclusive sense. To stop it being appropriated or diminished uh, and to make it clear that it has a relevance to everyone. So its roots, as everyone again in this room will know, are quite ubiquitous. It comes from the Latin verb cultivare, to plow or to till, as in agriculture. And subsequently, it's acquired the sense of a social and uh, of social and intellectual development. So, writing in the fifties, Raymond Williams argued that in Britain, at least, the meaning of the words art and culture, and our understanding of what culture is, changed around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Traditionally, art and culture had been words that were described processes and livelihoods of society and had, been ra uh, and had been based around the crafts of artisans. And instead, particularly the word art, but also culture, became descriptive of a certain kind of aesthetic and intellectual activity that were in some way divorced from daily life and divorced and opposed to some of the processes and ideas that came out of the industrial institutions. So you had this slight separation between real life, work, industry, 
and somehow on the other side there was this rather precious thing called art or culture. So in a way, culture became understood as an alternative to life, a retreat from it, a place where you went not to conduct your life, but to do something else maybe with your mind. And it became a word that provoked sometimes even hostility and quite often even embarrassment. So you don't have to agree with Williams's politics, he was a man of the left, to see that the general truth of his observation and the hostili that hostility and embarrassment have often colored the views of the popular press and politicians in England. I mean, I spent 30 years working at the Tate and certainly when I began there, much of what I was doing was to try to persuade the press, let alone the politicians, that actually contemporary art had a value in society, that contemporary art was an expression of contemporary mores, contemporary world, the contemporary world, contemporary life, and that it was not some, you know, something simply for a very privileged group of people, and it was also not something which was completely separated away from life. So, in Britain we do have some problems about the idea of the intellectual and the role of the public intellectual in France, for instance, is regarded as a valuable ingredient in public life. And, in, and, you know, someone can write in their passport their profession is to be an intellectual. And the passport officer doesn't look at it and say, what does this mean? Or would you please get a proper profession? Somehow, um, in England, the term intellectual is regarded as something that could be irrelevant or even unworldly. But I believe that a strong society needs a cultural conversation that involves everybody, not just an intellectual elite, not just a single group of people. And I believe that society as a whole needs to have a conversation and a recognition that culture is, can be ordinary that it can be, as he put it, remade, made and remade in every individual mind. So I think we need a better shared understanding of what we mean by culture. That we live, and th we, we live in and through our culture and arts, that they should play a role alongside creative activities, hobbies, passions, pastimes, those things that fuel people's lives and through which people express themselves and share their experience. I don't think we have to believe that every man is an artist, as Joseph Boyce once said, but I think we do need to recognize that every person has a creative dimension and that and they should be given an opportunity to express that. It's striking one of the things that we have been doing in terms of thinking about our strategy for the period 2020-2030 is to invite people to talk about whether or not they are involved in cultural activities. And we've been doing this using Ipsos Mori pol polling methods, not going to people who attend arts events, but talking to people across the country. And it's striking how many of the people and the public that we speak to still don't see themselves as taking part in cultural activities, even though in practice they may have very busy and rich cultural lives. They read, they're involved in music, they watch television drama, they watch films, obviously alongside sport and other pastimes. These are all cultural activities, but they don't necessarily regard them as being cultural. And the idea persists that culture remains for those people who already know about culture. There's life and there's culture and one needs somehow some kind of special passport to move from one to the other. Or perhaps you need a particular kind of education if you want to cross this border. However, I really feel that we need to seek a definition of culture that puts arts into everyday life and not beyond it, not into a separate box. It needs to be rooted in ev people's everyday experience and everyday lives. Um, the Arts Council, for the Arts Council, this is an important goal and an important journey. 
and it's a continuation of this sense of a post-war drive towards greater public participation. We have to admit, however, that the progress since, even since Jenny Lee's white paper, has been slow, and we need to significantly increase the pace of change. As some of you know, the clearest uh, expression of this intention to make a change has been our Creative People and Places program, which invests in arts and in cultural experience in places that haven't previously enjoyed much access. So Creative People and Places was established in 2012, and it's moved from an initial six projects now to 21, and it crosses the country. And these are projects that evolve through a partnership with communities, and they take a view of culture that incorporates the landscape, local traditions, stories, food, industry, sport, religion, and how people spend time with their family and friends. Often, the projects shine a light on histories and lives that have not been spoken about previously. Creative People in Places works with non-voluntary, with non-arts voluntary organizations and with community groups. And these are often much closer to communities than most of the traditional arts organizations. They include, in England at least, we've been working with walk, walking groups, refugee groups and asylum seekers, allotment societies, uh, residence associations, play groups, language and supplementary schools, and heritage group. There have also been trucking companies and clubs and even a group of pubs. So by the end of 2017, the project had reached more than two million people, most of whom had not previously really been engaged with arts activity. And we've recently announced a new round of funding uh, so that we can consolidate and then expand the program and it'll take our total investment up to 2022 to 90 million pounds and we should probably move to somewhere between 30 and 35 organizations across the country who are involved in this activity. It's not the only way um, that we can achieve cultural engagement but I think learning from it we can um, using the, the, the learning that we've had from working with particular communities, we can see that collaboration with non-arts voluntary groups, uh, listening to what people want rather than telling them what they should have, um, can inform the way in which we work more generally. And I think this is particularly relevant if we want to talk about how culture contributes to placemaking in helping to rejuvenate and bring a sense of optimism to communities that have suffered economically in a post-industrial society. And there's a growing understanding, I think, of how, strong, how a strong cultural life, in its broadest sense, can also bring social benefits. Cultural opportunities can reduce loneliness and isolation. Culture helps people of different backgrounds meet, explore their differences and create a shared identity. Um, as the UK government has recently recognised in its integration strategy. Uh, culture can play a key role in the creative industries, a sector which in England at least is growing much faster than the economy as a whole. And creative thinking that culture can instill is going to be a vital asset for every young person seeking employment in a changing society. If you don't have creativity as one of your skills, if you don't have adaptability, if you don't have an, a responsiveness to change, if you're fixed with a certain kind of training and a certain kind of discipline, and unable to think creatively, you will not prosper in a changing society. Culture is obviously vital to, you know, here we are in Visby, culture is vital to tourism. Um, it's an important part of a part, partner for the heritage sector, and it also contributes enormously in cities to the nighttime economy. So for the arts to contribute usefully, we need, as with creative people and places, to be sensitive to the communities we work with. We need to understand a place, its history, 
and the aspirations of its people. And when people, when culture starts to help improve people's lives, it's through informing the environment they live in and are shaped by, increasing their opportunity to participate, and also giving them the chance to r relate to a wider world. And for arts organizations, certainly in England, it means working with a broad range of partnerships. Traditionally, of course, we've worked with local government, but we're increasingly working with the National Health Service and with housing associations. So above all, I think it does mean partnership with the community. And we've seen some really significant successes. You look, for instance, uh, last year, Hull on the East Coast was the British city of culture. It had been long neglected as a city, but over the year, Hull became one of the Lenny Planet's top destinations. And it was a culmination of years of work and very focused investment involving many partners and especially important, thousands of volunteers from the city of Hull working across the year. Hull developed for itself a unique style and that style helped to restore civic confidence that had disappeared long before with much of the industry. And the catalyst for that change was culture. It's still, as we know, only the beginning of a story for Hull. We need to continue to make investment, but it does show what can be achieved when we don't impose cultural concepts because the program grew out of a discussion and a debate with the community. And we offer instead, rather than imposition, an opportunity and partnership to help people discover what culture means for them. I think this work has never really been more important if we want to recover a society in which citizens feel that they can have a say in how their lives are run and also have a say in how they shape their own futures. I know that in Sweden you have your own Creative Places program which operates in a similar way to Creative People and Places uh, in England and it grows from a really very good relationship between our two arts councils and it's a further example I think of the benefits that come from international cultural exchange and therefore I want to conclude with a word about that international exchange and how the free flow of ideas and people across borders helps us all not simply understand each other, but actually develop new identities. Um, some recent political events have reminded us how valuable international work and exchange can be for the very quality, for the diversity and the strength of our individual national cultures, and also for reinforcing the bonds that transcend political events. In England, we owe much of our identity, especially on our romantic side, to the contribution of incomers. We always talk about English culture or British culture, but actually it's astonishing how much of that culture that we now regard as British has been produced by immigrants. Go back to the 18th century, Handel came from Germany to be a favorite of the British court and the London stage. If you look at Michael Powell's films, they were scripted by Emmerich Pressburger, a Hungarian refugee. One of the major influences on the current school of British landscape writing, which is very powerful in Britain today, was a German, Max, or W.G. Max Sebald. And where would our contemporary visual arts be without artists, artists like Lucian Freud and Frank Garbach? who stand somehow now described as the pillars of what is called a school of London. Um, or in one, you know, one generation, or you look at the current generation, artists like Chris Afili or Mona Hatoum, Wolfgang Tillmans, John Acomfra. In an so the richness of cultural life in Britain comes through a combination of strong local sensibilities and a willingness to accept other cultural influences. 
And it's not only those who've chosen to live in Britain, but those whose work we've been fortunate enough to see that have contributed to that culture. There have been many influential theatre directors from abroad, perhaps none more so than um, someone like Ingmar Bergman, whose work inspired a generation of British theatre and film directors. So I believe that we need to give young people an even greater chance to see and be inspired by such creative forces than existed in my generation. And we need the stimulus of a different outlook and experience. And I think we've already been told we're going to talk about Brexit, so we will. <laughs> um, historically, there have been really very good links between Sweden and the other Nordic countries and the United Kingdom. And there's the agreement that has exists between the region Västergötland and Katy is going to speak, I think, in a moment. It exists as a relationship between the Northeast Cultural Partnership and the region here. Um, and that was a result of long-term exchange and understanding and also recent visits. And many of the arts organizations and individual artists supported by the Arts Council have growing relationships with Sweden. So Stella Hall, the director of Thrift from Red Car, recently visited Sweden for seminars and talks. And that was a direct result of the agreement between the Northeast and Region Vastra Gotland. Uh, Toby Lloyd, a visual artist, is working with Helix Arts in Newcastle University and is visiting fin Finland and Sweden this summer to explore um, attitudes towards universal basic income. In Stockholm, the Mancunian playwright Alan Andrew Sheridan, the winner of the Bruntwood Prize, is an assistant director at the Th City Theatre and has also been commissioned to write for them. And the workplace gallery in Gateshead represents the Swedish artists uh, Jakob uh, Dahlgren and Cecilia Stenbom. So these kind of reciprocal relationships are vital to sharing ideas and to developing creative practice. And they're also small but really integral parts of a huge economic picture. We all know that culture contributes to the economic wealth of societies. And UNESCO estimates that the size of the worldwide cultural and creative industry market is somewhere around $2.25 trillion. Um, in 2015-16, organizations funded by the Arts Council took more than 2,400 productions overseas. We sent 140 exhibitions and took part in more than 300 festivals. And those benefits of exchange and travel flowed back into communities because they represent more work for artists and performers, more money for local economies, and fresh inspiration for audiences. So all of us, I think, have an interest in ensuring that this work flourishes and grows in an unimpeded way. So the Arts Council has determined that we should look out into the world and encourage organizations that we support to do the same. In nature, uh, there's no place for monocultures. You can create very refined, exquisite blooms in a monoculture. But if you keep planting the same seed every year in the field, you know very well that the crop diminishes. And you have to have that mixture. You have to have new things, new forms coming in to sustain and develop resilience. And we need that international exchange if we're going to make work that really engages people who are looking out into the world, help people realize their creative potential, and help people learn and respect, learn from and respect their neighbors. So like everyone here, my life has been enormously enriched by the arts and I want to see everyone enjoying that kind of opportunity. And it's why I think the Arts Council's role continues 72 years on from its foundation to be a champion for the arts, a voice for the arts, an advocate for the arts, occasionally a thorn in the side of government in order to insist 
that the, we need to get blood, which is the money that allows us to take forward all these great practitioners of the arts to give a voice to those who have something to express. I want to thank you all for inviting me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. get some other people. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank Nick. You. Uh, thank you for this very, very inspiring and thought-provoking presentation. I think especially your comments on the relationship between art and life mm. is something that we really should think more about, mm. talk more about, and, and concern ourselves yeah. with more. Um, before I invite the rest of the panel to the stage, um, I'd like to ask you a few questions and also see if there are questions from the floor uh, that are urgent. <laughs> and my name is Ellen Wettmark. I'm the head of international affairs at the Swedish Arts Council. Um, so I'd like to start by asking you, you've, you've run a very, very successful museum, which was mainly based in London. And most of your career has been spent running museums in London, uh, mm. pre predominantly. Mm. And now in your role at the Arts Council, you're tasked with, in a way, possibly redistributing funds mm. from London to the rest of the country. How do you, how would you, with your experience of, of the role of, of a vital city like London and the role of arts and culture in that city, how do you balance the need for increased spending outside of the capital with uh, the desire to also regain and, and, and keep the role of a dominant city like London vital for the arts? Um. Well, of course, the easiest way to do it is to persuade government to give more money yeah. and to give a higher proportion of that yeah. money to the regions rather than to, into London. I mean, what we have been trying to do at the Arts Council is to use the lottery funding that we've been receiving in particular, but also some of the taxpayers' money, direct taxpayers' money, to do more outside London. But we do have a responsibility, as you say, to sustain some of the best production in London. Mm -hmm. I mean, a great difficulty, I think, for us now is you talk about London, mm -hmm. and of course, there's a big difference between the center of London and the edges of London. There are places around the edges of London, not really even very far from the center, mm -hmm. where there are significant areas of deprivation and economic hardship, mm -hmm. and people don't always have an opportunity in those places to travel, and they don't have an opportunity, to, they don't, certainly don't have a co or opportunity to come in to mm -hmm. Covent Garden and watch the Royal Opera House. Mm -hmm. The Royal Opera House perhaps sometimes has to go to them and uh, there is an interesting link between Barking and Dagenham, one of those deprived areas, and the Royal Opera House as it happens. But to answer your question, I think um, there's a real need for us to try and ensure that culture is something that people can participate in wherever they live mm -hmm. and not only if they're in a metropolitan center. And if that means in the longer term that we will have to be even more stringent with the organizations that are in metropolitan centers and insist that if they're going to receive funding that they must be working at the highest quality, but also that they must be reaching out, mm. then of course we will do so. Mm. And is there an understanding among the arts professionals mm. that that might be the, uh, the conclusion? Um, I think there's a great, well, there is, I think there's, look, every artist, mm. every theatre director, every filmmaker mm. wants to produce their best possible work. And they want that work to be, if necessary, supported. Mm. So you're not going to get a practitioner volunteering mm. to give their money mm. to someone else, probably. But what you can do, I think, is create a circumstance in which they recognize that it's important the Arts Council should be funding a range of art and not just one kind of art. Mm. Yeah. Um, in your role as director of Tate Galleries, uh, you've created some really groundbreaking initiatives. Tate Modern, of course, being the most well-known, but also the Turner Prize, which you sort mm. of mm. restarted. And the Turner Prize, for those of you who don't know, that is probably the most influential prize for contemporary art. But beyond being an important prize for artists, it also started a discussion uh, that 
invited people that were not necessarily the, the usual uh, contemporary art visitors to discuss, to have opinions, to think and talk about mm. art. Mm. Um, with, of course, uh, the challenges that comes with that. But what would you say to people who are concerned with what you're talking about, the fact that not everyone feels like they are involved in the arts, that want to try to do something as sort of uh, innovative and uh, exciting as those things? What, what were your lessons that you've learned from, from those initiatives? Um, I think, well, the Turner Prize was a way of focusing discussion about the nature of contemporary art because there were each year four artists who were presenting different visions of the world, uh, which may or may not touch the individual who views them. And we encouraged those individuals to leave their comments in a very public place, mm -hmm. to engage with us on social media increasingly, rather than just writing comments on cards. Mm -hmm. And that helped to stimulate a debate. But I think probably the most um, progressive thing that the Tate was able to do while I was director was not Tate Modern and was not the Turner Prize, but was probably to make strong relationships with institutions outside London. So in 2010, we established this group which we called Plus Tate because we kept finding that individuals, um, cities came to us, not just individuals, cities would come to us and say, you have a Tate in Liverpool and you have a Tate in St. Ives. We would like a Tate in Norwich or in Bristol or in Newcastle. And my argument was actually that museums really flourish when they are rooted in their communities. So they grow out of those communities. They express the values of those communities. And that if you parachute in a Tate from London, and I saw this in Liverpool, it took, 25, it took 20 years when after Tate Liverpool was created in 1988, for it to become recognised within that community as part of that community. And that only happened when Liverpool was the European city of culture in 2008. Before that, there was always suspicion. <laughs> Notwithstanding the wonderful things that were sent in terms of exhibitions. Mm. And, you know, we began with Rothko and Giacometti and surrealism. I mean, you know, it was really magnificent work. Um, that was being shown, but nevertheless, it wasn't seen as being part of that community. So I learned from that that really, as I say, museums have to be based in their communities. And for the Tate, it became much more effective to work with those institutions that were already established in cities. Mm -hmm. And we made this group. So instead of having you know, a Tate in Norwich, we would have the Sainsbury Centre plus Tate. Mm -hmm. So there was an additional bit that was added on. We called the scheme plus Tate. There were 36 organizations. They all had special access to the Tate's collection. They all had an ability to talk to each other. And in fact, actually, they began to establish a network and hold meetings that had nothing to do with the Tate, but were exchanging their own ideas. So it's made the position of not just contemporary, but also modern and historic British art much stronger within the, within the country. Yeah, that might actually be an idea that yeah. to pick up in Sweden and in mm. other countries mm. because it uh, yeah. sounds extremely yeah. uh, in interesting. I promised that I would ask you a question about Brexit as well before we invite the panel mm. and uh, <laughs> other questions. Um, in the run-up to the referendum, uh, a poll indicated that around 96% of artists and people working in art institutions or <laughs> representing art institutions uh, were against Brexit. Yeah. And now uh, everyone has to live with the consequences of, of the referendum. But what role can, wh how, first of all, what, what way will artists react to being sort of dragged into uh, to this against their will? Uh, and what is the role of, of artists in the coming years when we're approaching this new situation? Well, I suppose um, one of the roles, of course, will be for artists and arts organizations to continue to insist that the conversations have to be international rather than just national. I mean, obviously, you know, one of the dangers of Brexit is that the country turns in on itself mm. and that the divisions in society become more exposed. Mm. And it's one of the difficulties, I think, with a referendum mm. is it presents a very simple question, in or out. And we all know that life is not simple, that it's uh, much more complex. Mm. 
and therefore, you know, the arts can play a part in helping people to understand that life is complex. And we will simply have to renew our efforts to build international relationships. And at the moment, somehow, the rhetoric in England is that we have to build international relationships with countries beyond Europe. Mm. But if you look at the culture in the United Kingdom, it has so many connections with Europe. It is Europe. Mm. It may not be, it may no longer be part of the, the you know, economic mm. union. But it is part of Europe. If you look against the building blocks of society across the world at large, it is part of Europe and it will remain part of Europe in that sense. But it will be more difficult because mm -hmm. there will be restrictions on employment. It will be more difficult, as we know, to get visas for performing artists to come at short notice to perform and these kinds of things. But I think we, you know, the Arts Council has to argue with government that these barriers need to be re reduced, placed at the lowest possible level. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I'd like to invite <coughs> the other panelists to join us on stage, and we'll also invite sure. questions from the floor. But please Kathy. join me in welcoming Per Olsson Frid and Katja Hoflin. Per Olsson Frid is the Secretary of nice State of the nice Ministry for. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And Kathy Flynn, director of uh, West Cult culture director at Västra Götaland region. So Per, if I may start with you, uh, we've had a, heard a very interesting uh, presentation that spanned a lot of different questions. Um, I was going to ask you, <laughs> in what way is this? Uh, are the, the, the positions uh, and the, the question posed by by Nick relevant mm -hmm. in a Swedish context? Uh, is there anything in particular you'd like to pick up on? Uh, I'd like to pick up on exactly everything <laughs> that, uh, that uh, Sir Nicholas uh, actually addressed in his, uh, in his address here. Mm -hmm. I think starting from culture as a fundamental aspect of being human mm -hmm. and of being a society. I mean, if we start there, culture as a, as a process, as a, as a cornerstone in mm -hmm. a sustainable society, as a collective memory or as our collective consciousness mm -hmm. uh, in, in society, as a... As, a, as, a, as the heart and soul of the creative industry, as, as the um, catalyst of civic confidence, as the, as the piece of art that makes me believe, that makes me cry, that makes me laugh, that makes me, uh, that pushes my boundaries, that makes me understand that us is much larger than them, that there is no them, in a sense. If, and if we start there, and develop policies from mm. from there then what can we, what are we able to achieve with our society i mean mm. then then we can push everything mm. and, and 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 that starting point i think is uh, it was very inspiring mm. i agree Kathy, do you well, have a um i would like to be a bit uh, depressed yeah. <laughs> to begin with i loved your speech <laughs> very inspiring but i i keep thinking that we always talk to ourselves we are all hallelujah, culture is so important. It, it, we know this is like a lifelong flu that you get. You have this body, which is the arts. It may be literature, it can be contemporary visual arts or anything, but you always have it in your life. And we know this. But I would like to see a much broader conversation to address these issues um, cross sectors and across many parts of society so that culture people are not just talking to themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about, uh, I've been a chairman of the uh, government's reading delegation for two years um, and we had the uh, task of looking into is there uh, equal access to reading promotion and um, access to libraries and good education across our country. You know there, aren't, there isn't. No, of course there isn't. Uh, we're far <coughs> from equal. And this is a huge problem because if you don't get a rich language, you don't grasp uh, the nuances, mm. you get a bad life, you get sick, you die uh, before your time. So this is a huge issue. And what we found in this work was, of course, that we need to collaborate on a much uh, higher level. We need to change some structures, uh, like the stately structures, maybe, mm. where 
I know that the fact that it was the Minister for Democracy and Culture and the Minister for Education who worked together was like a very big thing. And I said, yeah, but where's the finance and <laughs> where, where's the corporate life and where's the social uh, department and so on? Because we need to have more sectors together. So that um, it just uh, it struck me that I, I love uh, to listen to you and to be reminded of how important this is in our lives, and especially now with the elections coming up mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but I, I miss some other parts, uh, some other actors that should also be concerned. Is there a question from the audience? I really feel like this is uh, the start of a, a great conversation <laughs> rather than just an interview situation. So there's a rowing mic. If anyone dares to be the first one to, to uh, raise a question, otherwise we'll just continue talking. And or do you, you, s you look like you want to... <laughs> do you want to join? No, no, not that I. <laughs> 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 the dying issue that Oh, but it's yeah. true, you know, there's a lot of research on this, Kirsten, yeah. that you, you really die earlier. You but get sick, you take a lower education if you, if you do, or you, yeah. you might end up being a criminal or just sad or angry. But I think something is happening right now yes. that we need we need to, to grab the hold on and hold on to. Mm -hmm. And it's an increased relevance of culture in society as a whole. Mm -hmm. That we've moved, and I think this is very much, I mean, I, I'd like to think that as, as we as, as uh, the political leadership of the ministry has, has done something about that, but, but, uh, but I think it's more the cultural sector itself that we have moved away from discussing only the sort of self-value, egenwärdet, Mm -hmm. of culture and arts, mm -hmm. to the value of culture and arts. And it, it, it's much broader. And that we, mm -hmm. we now dare to visualize this, and we need to, to, to touch that, and we need to communicate that. And, and, and therefore, there is now a, big, a greater relevance, and I would say a greater interest also in other sectors mm -hmm. to talk with culture, mm -hmm. uh, because they know that if they do, and if we involve culture, not only in, 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 in tourism and creative industries, but in, in you know, building, uh, physical planning, uh, health, yeah. education, uh, sustainability in a broader sense. What you're we, talking we about our, now is the regional way of working. Yes. That's exactly the way exactly. we always work. Yeah. Anybody else from a region here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's always like infrastructure, healthcare, yeah. environment, yeah. human rights. And, and people who are here from the regions, they know that I've, I've been saying this for four years. Like yeah. what we have, what we see in the local context, it's I mean, it's much more work this way. Mm -hmm. And what we see in a national context is, is work this way. Yeah. And, and, we, and we know that we, to challenge the future, we, we need to work this way. And, and that's why we also need a bottom-up uh, uh, vision for this. And, and from a uh, being a, poli you know, a, a politic, well, well, working with politics <laughs> on a national <laughs> level, um, I mean, uh, there's so much to learn from how you actually uh, address things uh, locally. Yeah. Marika, you want to? No, I just uh, thank you for your speech yeah. and yeah. thank you for having us here, it's lovely, a little perspective. I'd just like to have this, you said just one line, you said something happened with culture during the industrial revolution, when it sort of changed from being part of our lives mm. into something different, something that we did on our free time. Mm. And as you know, and also in this country, all of Europe, there are now political parties who are sort of have some kind of sensation that we should go back to a time before the industrial revolution and have mm. only a culture that's part of our life. I just would like you to talk a little bit about, <laughs> a little more about what actually happened and how can we sort of address these uh, politicians and these people talking about like, one of our parties that is now 20% of the population, he says there should only be f arts that you can see what, it's me what it shows, a figurative yeah. art, for example. Yeah. And he talks about that kind of uh, art. So I'd just like you to broaden that discussion a little bit because, because we, we really need that. We read all, all uh, the uh, arguments <coughs> for that. Okay, so I would simply say, if you're going to look back in history, you have to look really carefully at what happened in the 1930s. Yeah. And similar arguments were being made 
about a certain kind of national culture. Mm -hmm. And we know what the consequences was, mm. were of that. So I think you have to be really careful when you appeal to the past, also to recognize that there are some bad things that happened in the past, as well as wonderful things. Mm. And, <laughs> yeah, so, okay, fine. I think that if you're thinking about the future, irrespective of the difficulties of globalization, we also know that we live in a world where interaction across national boundaries has to be part of our long-term economic success, has to be part of our long-term, in my view, social success, and you cannot live in an isolated world. If you try to live in an isolated world, as I was suggesting about monocultures, mm -hmm. mm. you will really diminish mm. everything that we value in our lives. But it's easy to say to a group of people who believe what I've just said. <laughs> it's more difficult with a group of people who don't believe that, who, don't, who haven't experienced the richness, who haven't themselves perhaps understood that actually you need a wider view of the world. I think also we <coughs> must take responsibility for creating these uh, talks where we actually try to listen and understand each other mm -hmm. instead of saying, you're an idiot, you don't understand the arts, I've seen the light. Uh, we need to actually try, why don't you go mm. to a museum? Mm. Are you? What, what's the mm. obstacle? Mm. So we need to provide these meeting places and have these talks much, much more. The interesting thing is the way in which so many people will say, I myself don't understand about the arts or culture, mm -hmm. but I want my children to understand. Mm -hmm. So when they think about the future, they always think that this does actually represent a new opportunity. Yeah. And it's a, in some way a better world. Mm -hmm. Um, it's rather, I mean, we are un under a lot of pressure in the United Kingdom at the moment in terms of library services. But actually, library services are so integrated into society in a way that much arts and culture is not. Mm -hmm. People use these spaces yes. for all kinds of interaction, as you know any too well, and other people who work in libraries. I'm always envious of people who work in libraries. They never have enough resources, but they always do have the support of their communities. You're probably welcome to work in a library yeah. if you want to. They're <laughs> understaffed. <laughs> I hear they're understaffed yeah. in England. Yeah. But I think, I mean, and I, I'm, I'm happy you say so. I mean, this is also the reason why, w w as a government, we tried to, to increase funding to the cultural institutions that are closest to us as, mm. as people in our communities. Mm. The, the local music and cultural schools, uh, the, the local libraries. Mm. Uh, the uh, the Royal Library now working with the National Library stru uh, Strategy to 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 make sure that and and also the whole heritage uh, policies and, and opening up our museums to make sure that culture is also the arena for that kind of meeting mm -hmm. uh, and I think my or my experience is that culture can can process or facilitate that discussion that outside of the cultural <coughs> arena we cannot have because we get too angry with each other mm. and we stop listening. But mm. when culture is, is, is the facilitator, then we listen. Then I feel mm. and I recognize you. Uh, and, 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 and from there and on, we, we build uh, uh, resilience, uh, yeah. as, you, as you mentioned, in, in our society. Mm. We have some questions, yes. I think people yeah. are. <laughs> I hope I did listen. Thank you very much for your uh, talk, you. every one of you. Especially this question about how to integrate culture in the society. <coughs> we have just now an election in the future, rather soon. There have been a lot of talk from uh, leaders of the parties. Nobody had mentioned the word culture. <laughs> they talk about a lot of questions, healthcare, uh, integration, uh, more uh, weapons, and uh, NATO, <laughs> and so on. And uh, we don't know exactly how to handle it. If you are our culture lovers, we are sitting here. Everyone here is engaged in the culture sector. Mm -hmm. We have no generals here, and we have no social workers here. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we have, but mostly... Yeah, mm -hmm. we have well, a social worker. Hey. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mostly we culture lovers talk with each other. Mm -hmm. And 
the big question is how can we solve that problem that the culture sector is a part of the society. In the newspaper, we have culture pages. That's not in the common uh, pages. We have sport pages for the sport lovers and so on. How can we change that? It must be a part of our life as culture workers to tell people that we are a part of society and we must integrate our society wishes with the traditional politicians. And we have a very important question in that, that we must sit, look like that the culture is a queen as a solution for one of the big questions, for the exactly the integration questions today. Mm. It's so, a culture um, question. So per, maybe that is, uh, can you say is something about, yeah, <laughs> perhaps yeah. something yeah. about yeah. how yeah. you work yeah. within no. the... Sure. No, I, mean, I mean, I represent a, a minister who, who does talk about culture every day, and we wish, of course, that culture was a much uh, higher up on the agenda before the election. But, but let's understand also the culture of parties, the political parties. They will, or we will, discuss what we can see in the polls are the most important issues for people. And, and, and culture, uh, cultural policy is not there. But as, as I think you mentioning, which I think is the correct way of addressing this, is that if integration, if security <coughs> issues, if healthcare, if education is on the top of the agenda for the election, how do we make culture, the role of culture in those areas more visible? How can we talk about the role of culture in, in building <coughs> civic confidence, in building trust in, in, in societies, in improving healthcare, in, in making sure that education is for all? How can we do that? We can do that a lot better, I think. But, but we as cultural lovers, I love the term, I belong to them, we, m we must make sure that it's not only us, because it's always the sector of culture who has to sort of use their elbows to get yeah. into healthcare or get into education, to be part of the classroom. Yeah. We, we, need, we need social workers, teachers uh, and others to invite and open up and, and see the value of culture. And I think that's, that discussion is, is still uh, ahead of us, is still Nick, in front of Nick, us. Can I then uh, yeah. pick up on this? In, in England, uh, the argument, that the sort of the economic argument for, for arts and culture has been made quite strongly from the arts sector and quite successfully as well. Um, do you see any risks with that? Or do you, is, is this a way forward? Or need it, does it need to be more balanced between other uh, agendas and aspects of, of the value of arts and culture as well? Well, I think that, um, as I've been arguing, mm -hmm. you know, the arts and culture play a, should play a part in everyone's life, mm -hmm. and everyone would agree with that. Um, I think it's important, as you advance these arguments with politicians, mm -hmm. that you don't also lose the recognition that there is, notwithstanding what I've been saying, mm -hmm. something very intangible mm -hmm. and something very special mm -hmm. about an art or cultural experience, mm -hmm. which goes beyond the tourist benefit, which mm -hmm. goes beyond the economic benefit. Mm -hmm. That's the bit which is actually difficult to get mm -hmm. certain politicians mm -hmm. to appreciate. Mm -hmm. But I don't mind using all these other arguments mm -hmm. if it allows us mm -hmm. to fund organizations and fund creative individuals mm -hmm. who then give us something which becomes memorable, which mm -hmm. becomes part of our experience of having visited a given place or seen a particular performance. There's a good <coughs> example in, uh, in Denmark where mm. the <coughs> Danish uh, Librarian Society for Bibliotheksföreningen, they did uh, a survey uh, try. as to <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the increase in GDP and mm. uh, tried to see is there a connection, is there some sort of link uh, with libraries and uh, economic growth and they could actually find a link and that was no cultural organization yeah. checking it out. It was, a, you know, just straightforward consulting business, always analyzing any business. And they analyzed this and they could see that if you go into a library, you may be 10 or 11 years old, you get to become one of those uh, culture lovers. Um, you read a lot of books, you take a higher education, you get a higher salary and you bring in to GDP. So yeah. that the cost for libraries in Denmark were then, I think, four uh, billion. Uh, in total, I don't remember, but the increase in GDP, thanks to libraries, was seven. Mm. 
So sometimes we need these arguments, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to embrace them also a little mm -hmm. bit and not be afraid maybe, because we're always afraid that art will be snatched by some other interest, like, okay, now we're going to uh, save the world, we're going to make people healthier. We're going to stop people dying. <laughs> no, <laughs> stop <laughs> we're going to stop dying, people from yeah. dying. <laughs> yeah. No, but you see what I mean? That, yeah. it, that would somehow hurt art, this yeah. fragile thing that mm. we're talking about. But I think we need to talk about both both mm. things, mm. probably. I think Sir Nicholas' example of Hull Nick. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is Nick, sorry, mm. Nick's example of Hull is is, 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 it's splendid because mm. we need more of those. So we don't want uh, mm. societies and villages where people just move away. Mm. We want them to stay, we want them to build, to be proud, to, yeah. to, 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 to find meaning in mm. staying in a, in a rural setting also. Mm. And, and, and the first thing that comes on top of people's mind then is, mm. is more or less culture. Yeah. So. But I have some examples. I'm new at my job in the Vestra region, Vestra Jötaland, as it's called in English, but <laughs> the the Fengerfors uh, paper mill, uh, which is, if you look closer at that, uh, there has to be a whole ecosystem, a chain of things that needs to be in place if you get this uh, uh, place mm -hmm. to become a really growing, living cultural place. Mm -hmm. And that's education and it's a collaboration with the county administrative board or the Agency for Economic and Regional Growth and the region yeah. and the municipality and uh, academia. Mm. So. That's, there why, are a that's, lot why, that's why it's so exciting to work in the job you have. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Extremely exciting, but yeah. y the more yeah. you do this, yeah. you see that collaboration is yeah. the mm. thing. Yeah. Mm. So we have time for two more questions. So there's one question here and one question here. Um, might, maybe we have time for one third, Benson. So, so yeah, please go. Um, uh, Martin Gilbert from the British Council. Um, I'm very, very uh, really interested in the discussion you're, you're having, and I, I'm hearing it again and again the art sector needing to break down the barriers into other sectors and become more inclusive mm -hmm. um, in terms of reaching different groups of people and also reaching into really different sectors of society. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to highlight the fact that um, Nick will be on a panel at one o'clock this afternoon <laughs> with a marine ecotologist, mm -hmm. um, another uh, person, a professor from a university in the UK talking about enzymes that break down plastic PET, and Mandy Barker, who's an internationally renowned um, photographer of marine plastics, which are clogging up our oceans. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's a good example, I think, of, of, of crossing sectors, and uh, ecology, the environment, is something that touches everybody's lives mm -hmm. and everybody's hearts. So mm. our attempt in this panel later at one o'clock mm. this afternoon is to try and bring these things together. Excellent. But really enjoying the discussion, thank you. thank you. Excellent. So there's a question here as well on the other side of the aisle. No, there's a, this one. She waited. Beautiful discussion and beautiful energy. I'm sitting like, woo -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and uh, I'm very curious about the experience in England. So, question to you, first of all, Nick. Uh, I've been myself working with an integration project in the region where we used the uh, events and culture and music as a way to um, integrate the uh, young uh, unaccompanied people who came here. And um, uh, you, it warmed my heart really a lot when you said that, yeah, British culture has been built also by immigrants a lot, and you have mm. named some big names that were from a bit earlier times. Mm. And I'm curious, how has the recent um, uh, wave of migration, which was named in the media as migration crisis, refugee crisis, how has it affected the acceptance level <laughs> of other cultures in England? And uh, has there been any change or has there been any, any um, like more uh, how going against it? Because, for example, in Sweden, when you do an event and you try to breach the two, uh, it's when you do an event that's more about Swedish culture, super difficult to bring immigrants. When you do an event about immigrant culture, let's say Afghani music or Syrian music, super difficult to bring Swedish, even younger people. So I'm curious how is, yeah, maybe you have faced the same issue. How is well, I think um, last autumn I was at an event which celebrated um, 50 years since the foundation of the city of Milton Keynes, which is a city f 60 kilometers from London. It was a new city. It was built around the idea of the car. It was about the future as it was seen at that moment. 
and when it was first established, most of the people who lived in it had come out of the poorer parts of London, and they were essentially one class of person, together with another band that was introduced that were kind of managers who had education. So it was a very monocultural city. But when they celebrated their 50th anniversary, they did so with a series of street events that were built around the idea of a mela. Most of the performers were Asian. The whole city was energized by this event. And there was a general recognition that the whole nature of the city had changed. And that it had changed for the better, not for the worse. That actually the richness that had arrived with an immigrant community, albeit that was one that had been there over 10, 15, 20 years rather than six months, was actually part of the identity of the city as it moves forward into its second half century. So that felt to me like a very positive solution. And I think the answer is to your question is it doesn't happen overnight. It happens by steady investment by p people like the Arts Council or by the National Health Service or by the Education Service to try and draw out. And I do think that it's about holding on to certain identities, but then seeing those identities beginning to infuse you know, the culture as a whole, not being entirely just separate. So one last question. Well, I'm former Deputy Mayor of Malmo and, and yeah. working with culture, and I've also been in politics. Uh, and um, uh, one of the things which is very special, well, it's, I think it's extra special in Sweden, we are very segmented. Mm. Business don't meet, politicians, politicians don't meet, artists, artists mean, don't b meet business, unless, you, of course, you're Secretary of State. Uh, but I mean, and, and it's your job to meet people. Uh, if, I'm, if I, I use my different connections to bring people together, I found out that politicians look strangely at the art people, and the art people look strangely at the politicians. Mm. But another thing is, also recent experience, the performing arts people don't understand the, the cultural heritage people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if I look around, you ask, why don't we reach out? If I look around all these cultural seminars this year, last year, the year before that, yes, we are all, as many have said, we're all same, we're the same family, we're all art lovers. However, why isn't there ever someone from business? Why isn't, that, why, why isn't the Minister of Finance invited to a, a seminar on culture? Uh, why isn't uh, uh, the, the city planner of Gothenburg invited to a seminar? Why don't we ourselves in this sector reach out? I remember when, when, when I was a very young guy, uh, the, 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 the city building committee. It took a couple of weeks and I got loads of information from everybody in the sector. Many years later, I became the owner, so to say, of one of the biggest cultural budgets in Sweden. No one sent anything. Not the arts organizations, not the, the arts council, nobody. When there is not an infrastructure, we don't take care of the internal no, that's information. Like a, a and we also have to, and finally, mm. yes, we also have, because there is also an internal, also in, in this sector. Uh, mm. Our people, bureaucrats, artists, tend to keep the art politicians mm. out of the sector, which means them less prepared when they meet their colleagues who come from the, 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 the hospital sector or whatever, full of information. Mm. Thank you. Do you have well, a I, I would just say that I think, mm. it, I think the starting point is at city and region level, where people are living in the same community and they can identify common interests. It's much more difficult at the national level. Mm -hmm. But I do think that in small, you know, even quite large communities. If you look at a city like, for instance, Manchester, which has transformed itself in the last 15, 20 years by building a community of interests between business, health, the arts, and, in, and developing a cultural plan for the city, which brings all those people around the same table. And it, I think it makes a difference. Yeah. Just, I, I, I mean, I recognize this. I think um, what I, I want to mention in this context also the, the, the new policy for designed living environments that we've, that we've worked with uh, and that we, you know, that's now passed Parliament in, in, in May. 
uh, and, and I, I participated in, in several panels at this Almedal and on that context and in, in that policy that we from culture, uh, the culture ministry did together with the environmental ministry and the ministry of, of uh, industry and housing that we now sit in the same panels, in the same discussions with the housing industry, with, uh, with, uh, with heritage, with public art, with environmental sustainability actors, uh, and across policy fields. And we now meet, and we recognize values from, from different sectors in that. In that and so we need to create, I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is I think you're correct, and I think what we, what, we, what we can do is that we can create new policy fields mm. where we actually yeah. engage, and, 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 and what happens then is, is, is fantastic. But mm. when you have this model then, uh, then it can also be scaled. It can so be you scaled. can use that as mm. a, an example. We can work like yes. this cross sectors, and then you can apply that to any mm. other idea I mean, that you might get. The world is full of possibilities. No. Yeah. That's a very good way to end. <laughs> That's a good, That's a good end. Uh, yeah. If, yeah, it feels terrible to break up this extremely yes. vibrant yes. and interesting conversation. But thank you so much. I'll hand thank over you. to Ulrike. Thank you. 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 Thank you.